thank you all for coming to this afternoon's session entitled Avoiding Common Pitfalls in Preclinical Animal Research Design. This session is sponsored by the Animal Care and Experimenta Experimentation Committee of the American Physiological Society. I am the session chair. My name is Dan Michael, and sitting to my right is Karen Urai. Um, we are both faculty representatives um, on the ACE committee, and we put together this symposium to talk a little bit about um, animal research and particularly how to design experiments uh, for doing preclinical studies aimed at uh, translating discoveries to um, ultimately to drugs. And um, we have three speakers this afternoon. Our, uh, our, uh, we'll cover a variety of topics um, related to um, preclinical research design. And our first speaker is uh, Dr. James Fox. Uh, he is the director of comparative medicine at MIT. And his um, background is that he has a master's degree in med med medical microbiology uh, at Stanford, and then he did his DVM at Colorado State University. And um, he's continued on uh, doing comparative uh, medicine research, and in particular, his research has been focused a little bit on comparing how physiological results are impacted by things like strain background in, in animal models. And uh, he's, if, you've, if you're interested in, in uh, animal uh, research, you may have heard of ALAC before. He's a past chairman of the ALAC Council, and he's also the past chairman of the Comparative Medicine Studies section at the NCCR at NIH. So today he's going to be giving us a talk uh, about selecting the appropriate animal model in preclinical research. Jim. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, conveners of this meeting to, for inviting me to talk to you today about what which is, has always been, but increasingly so, an important uh, discussion point for those of us using animal models for biomedical research. So uh, today I'm going to concentrate uh, on variables that can influence our in vivo preclinical research. And all of us who read the literature are aware of the criticism that our in vivo models have uh, sustained over the last several years in terms of how our studies are not reproducible from lab to lab, and often the incriminating feature to that is the use of these animal model systems. So what are the problems that have been described for animal studies? Certainly the experimental design problems uh, last year, I understand this group had a session on reproducibility in which they discuss proper biostatistics, blinding, randomization, sample size, and the issue of low reproducibility. So today we'll concentrate on the animal model itself and why there is transmissibility problems in selecting these models for predictive power for the human condition. So what are, in a composite sense here, what are the factors that influence animal research? In a broad sense, we have intrinsic factors and we have extrin extrinsic factors. And we're all aware of the intrinsic factors such as the genetics of the host, age, sex, the immune status uh, of the individual animal, its, its nutritional status, the importance of uh, maintaining circadian rhythms in these animals and establishing homostasis for endocrine modulations. Then we have the ex extrinsic, which are physical, chemical, and increasingly appreciated the importance of the host microbiota in uh, uh, assessing outcome. So one of the first tasks that we all have when we're selecting an animal model is to, uh, to approach it systematically 
And today we're, we're blessed with the availability of a large number of repository animals that have been deposited and phenotyped and characterized to a great extent in these resource facilities. So again, it's incumbent upon all of us to, to select very carefully the animal model that you want to select and certainly to do a database research to see if the model that you have in mind is available through uh, this resource. Again, a, a very important consideration. So we've heard a lot from NIH and other sources today about sex differences and we appreciate, but it's often, quite frankly, has been ignored in the literature that disease prevalence and severity of disease is, can be and often is dependent on the sex of the animal. The published literature is often sex skewed for historical or logistical reasons, and this is particularly true uh, for those of us who do neurological research where it's much more common to use a male a subject than a female subject. As I mentioned, NIH is now requiring that we use both sexes when we uh, establish a particular study, and uh, they argue, which is understandable, that these sex differences must be known and are needed to accurately model human disease. So when you start thinking about variables, we've established the appropriate animal model, whether it's from a repository, a commercial firm, or commonly we receive our animals that have been genetically engineered from various PI labs. So all of those factors are taken into consideration. We order the animals, but what happens during the process of the animals at the given site being transported to your uh, facility and vivarium. Obviously, you need to understand how are these animals housed in their conventional facilities in isolators or under uh, SPF barrier conditions. You need to know about transport in terms of temperature, food source, and then importantly, when these animals arrive at your institution, it's routine that they undertake a lengthy quarantine period so they can be surveyed for infectious diseases uh, of, of uh, rodents and whether that's done, which takes weeks, or alternatively, much more common today is embryo transfer derivation where the animals come in, they're re-derived onto a surrogate dam and then uh, released in after testing into the uh, facility in question. All of these various steps obviously have ramifications in terms of eventual outcome of the study envisioned. So what about some of the devilish details of rodent husbandry? Timing, certainly I mentioned circadian rhythms, but this influences how the mouse responds immunologically, and it's important that you describe and document at what time during the day are you actually doing the experimental manipulation because this will have a potential profound effect on the model system. More, uh, more recently, it's appreciated that temperature variability has profound effects on uh, study design and outcome. And interestingly, mouse facilities typically house animals at a lower temperature range which uh, dictates a mild cold stress, which may ramp up their metabolism and making them more prone to inflammation and tumor development. So all of these subtle variables are important in terms of interpreting your experimental results. What about the bedding that these animals uh, reside on? Certainly, uh, rodent cages are filled with various types of bedding, whether it's wood, corn cob, paper, and what are the effects of this bedding? Corn cob, we know, can inhibit estrogen signaling, and some types of wood, particularly softwoods, uh, boost the P450 uh, enzymes in the liver and affects drug metabolism. So all of these things that you think, well, 
I'm just going to get my animals in, they're going to go into the vivarium, and everything is going to be fine. That's not always the case. Shelf level, where are my mouse housed in a given in, uh, animal holding room? Are they on a lower shelf, a mid shelf, or an upper shelf? And this is important as we appreciate that light intensity affects in many strains of mice retinal degeneration. So if, you, if you're worried about running these animals in a, a certain maze where visual acuity is important, then this obviously has an effect. It also has an effect, again, in phenotyping your mouse model, certain strains of mice have a natural progression of retinal degeneration like the FBB. So those wouldn't be good for neurobehavioral work. And then there's you. You or your research technicians or your postdoc graduate students who are going into the facility and manipulating these mice. And it's clear from experimental studies that mice can distinguish uh, individual uh, smells of the individual uh, uh, personnel handling these mice. And the presence of men rather than women has a higher level of stress hormones in these mice and milder pain response. So even the subtle differences of who is handling your animals in the vivarium may impact your research outcome. We all obviously appreciate the effect of handling and stress-induced levels of corticosterones uh, in animal manipulation. But again, even though we appreciate it, you should be aware of how are the animals being handled not only by your research staff or you personally, but how does that translate to how the animals are handled when they're, freak when they're changed from week to week uh, for clean bedding changes and, uh, and scrutiny of their uh, medical conditions. So all of these things have important outcomes and again, communication is critical in terms of your mouse experimentation. You need to know and appreciate what the animal care technician staff in the animal resource program are doing and how they can help and nurture your experiments in a concerted manner that there's good dialogue between the two groups. What about implications for reproducibility? Certainly, we always worry about nutritional status, but this recent interesting study uh, <coughs> conducted on water quality in terms of nod mice of type 1 diabetes. And the, the study design is that they have mice on acidified drinking water in some instances to reduce microbial contamination in a vivarium. And actually, that's how Jackson laboratories maintain their nod mice they have them on acidified drinking water. So what effect does acidified drinking water have on disease outcome in this case? Well, very interestingly, those on the acidified water had a lower incidence of uh, onset of type 1 diabetes as indicated here histologically. Here's the acidified where you have much less pathology Here's the neutral water or standard water that they're feed. And so again, uh, you have reduced onset of diabetes in the acidified water. And the contention in, in this study is it's due to modulation of the microbial flora that results in this very interesting phenotype. So recently, there was an interesting paper in Science just published about what was described by the author of this uh, editorial as the happiness project. Well, what is the happiness project? I mean, we're all doing science, right? So everybody should be very committed to their science and doing it in a robust manner. But there's uh, regulatory uh, initiatives that are saying that in the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals, where they're stipulating that because these rodents are a naturally social species, 
they should be, number one, socially housed if possible. So this means that you shouldn't be individually housing animals on a routine basis unless there's strong scientific justification. And what it's done is spawned a whole, what we would call a cottage industry in terms of enrichment devices that are put into cages. And you can see here that these enrichment devices take on several different uh, geographic physical characteristics and they're put in these uh, rodent cages for, for social enrichment. And the, the uh, rationale for this actually was published in 2000 by a neuroscientist in Australia where he had a transgenic model for a Huntington's disease and he decided to enrich a subset of those uh, mice with social enrichment such as nests and brightly colored balls, ladders, etc. And he showed that the animals that had this enrichment were much slower to develop sy symptoms of the Huntington-like disease. And it was the first demonstration that enrichment could significantly influence these neurological disorders. So where does that take us today? It takes us into an arena where these enrichment devices are much more common than they were five years ago, certainly more than 10 years ago. And we must consider that as part of the animal uh, use protocol in terms of the oversight that's being provided to our mice on study. But remember that the effect, the effect of these enrichment devices is going to depend in large part on the stocking density of the animals having this enrichment uh, provided to them, the age, obviously, as we've been discussing, the sex, the strain of mouse, the duration of enrichment, and the specific forms of enrichment provided. And it's not sufficient to say, oh, well, my mice are going to get enriched devices. You need to know what they are. How long are these, are they, are they being rotated? Are they maintained for the duration of your study? Again, you need to interface with the uh, animal care group to uh, agree and, di and dialogue with them about the appropriateness of a given enrichment device. I believe it's critically important you do so. So many of us in the audience have spent a great deal of our time and effort looking at uh, murine pathogens, uh, not only murine pathogens, but as this uh, book depicts by uh, Dr. Baker from LSU, that they've studied extensively pathogens in a variety of different species of animals which have been recognized not only to cause morbidity and mortality, but importantly to alter immunological or other parameters in the animals that you're studying. So today, a great deal of effort is relegated to monitoring your given animal for a profile of these various opportunistic or primary pathogens. There have been a number of surveys done in, in mouse uh, questionnaires sent to various institutions across the country showing that uh, it depends on what the disease profile is going to look like if you have animals housed in a barrier, a non-barrier, or a combination. So just concentrate on uh, the number of mouse uh, parvovirus outbreaks. You can see it doesn't vary much between their barrier and barrier, and this is true for the uh, percentage of mouse colonies infected with pinworms or fur mites, fur, fur mite outbreaks. So again, if you look at the lower table, you can see that there's three surveys conducted over a 20-year period that you have less murine viruses such as parvovirus, uh, uh, epidural uh, rotavirus of infant mice, mouse hepatitis, etc. But if you look in this column in 
today, this 2017 study, you can see we still have outbreaks of, of mouse parvovirus and we still have outbreaks of pinworms and fermites. So progress has been made, understandably, with extensive surveillance, uh, monitoring of, of colonies on a routine basis, commercial vendors taking this very seriously and providing us uh, with clean animals to conduct our study. However, one does not know when there's going to be a new agent arriving on the scene that can confound various research results. And I give you an example of work done in our laboratory where we first recognized and isolated and characterized a helicobacter species from mice from the NCI. And the reason for this was that these mice, control mice that were being used at NCI, historically they used the AJCR because they had a low level of, of hepatitis and tumor development in their control animals. But what happened is their control animals started developing 100% hepatitis and a very, very high percentage of hepatocellular carcinoma. So they shipped these animals to our laboratory and we were able to, because we were working on Helicobacter pylori, uh, the human disease which causes peptic ulcer disease and gastric cancer, we had the facilities available to us to actually culture this new novel organism which we uh, subsequently named a hepaticus. Then to extend this further, after this discovery, the NTP program in North Carolina realized that they were having a problem in interpretation of some of their long-term carcinogenesis assays depicted here. And they went back uh, in, in working with us, established that all of these studies, their control animals were compromised, had high levels of hepatitis, adenocarcinoma, because of the presence of this new, newly recognized helicobacter. We now know that worldwide these organisms not only hepaticus, but another, uh, a number of uh, closely related strains colonize mice, particularly in academic institutions. So what does this mean in terms of experimental design other than natural occurrence of disease that I've just discussed? You can see here in collaborations with our colleagues at Hanover, Germany, we took, uh, because these organisms colonize the lower bowel, they're now routinely used for IBD studies, particularly in IL-10 mice or in rag mice. And you can see here that we gave the 3B type strain to the uh, German cohort of mice of C57 blacks and compared it to the same strain being inoculated at MIT and realized that there was a marked difference in the ability of this organism to induce lower bowel inflammation. Very little here, but marked inflammation in the MIT colony. Looking at the microbiome again, it was established that the, the, uh, the study was done in two different cohorts in, in Hanover, Germany, and our cohort at MIT. And you can see that the disease profile, not the disease, the microbial profile, the shared organisms are present here but there are unique organisms in each of these colonies. And we uh, hypothesize that in addition to diet and other possible var variability in the husbandry procedure, that the microbiome is playing a profound effect on disease outcome. This has been reaffirmed in a recent study out of the University of Missouri, uh, reaffirming that if you take three different strains of dams, that have been ET derived on, the, the IL-10s have been ET into these uh, Charles River, Jackson, and Deconic mice. And so the, the offspring are gonna have three different flora that you can look at after they've been infected with H. hepaticus. And you can see here again that the Charles River mice, both in the colon and the cecum, have much less pathology than the other two sources of animals with different microbial profile. <clears throat> Quickly, what about other commensal organisms? 
There's a lot of literature now on the segmented filamentous bacteria, which are commensals in different strains of mice. <coughs> and interestingly, this particular organism is present in Jackson and Charles River mice, but uh, are Jack, uh, not Charles, it, the organism is present in Charles River and Deconic mice, but not in Jackson mice. So already you're having a variability of an important organism that's present in some of our commercial strains, but not in others. And what does that mean? It means that this organism is, is, uh, is now identified as a potent inducers of uh, TH17 cell differentiation and can have an effect on autoimmunity and uh, infection. So again, one organism recently identified as an important mediator of the inflammatory response. What about the whole, uh, whole discussion, which we don't have time today about, is about the hygiene hypothesis and educating the host immune system to uh, subsequent exposures such as allergies and infectious diseases. And again, it's showing the importance of germ-free animals in terms of recognizing that these animals without an indigenous floor are much more susceptible to specific diseases such as IBD and asthma, and how if you colonize these germ-free mice, they're protected, particularly when you do it when they're young. So we now know recent studies out of Minnesota took this leap of faith to ask about educating the host immune response and convince the IACUC and the comparative medicine group at Minnesota that they allowed these uh, mice from pet stores and uh, wild feral mice to come into their facilities. And so obviously there's a lot of discussion, where are we gonna house these animals? How are we gonna maintain their uh, uh, separation from them versus the, the SPF animals? And you can see these pet stores, if you, if you can see from the back of the room, they have about every known murine virus they have all sorts of ba bacterial uh, pathogens as well as parasitic pathogens. And so they asked the question, how do they respond immunologically compared to our laboratory maintained mice? And you can see that the laboratory maintained mice have a uh, much larger population of naive, naive CD8 uh, T cells versus those uh, housed at pet stores where they're exposed, infected with a variety of agents, they have a much higher profile of antigen-experienced T cells. And the same goes for the lower graph, where you can see the immune response of the pet store and those co-housed mice that have picked up the, the flora from the pet mice have a much more robust uh, IgG response uh, to various antigens. So, in closing, we now are talking about factors which I mentioned initially uh, in terms of intrinsic versus extrinsic, but now we are faced with the big question, how is the gut microbiota really influencing uh, our experimental studies and the importance of each of these, uh, the, the variability of the microflora in terms of the diet, husbandry, source, delivery, derivation, all intermixed with the, in, in, in the uh, composition of the intestinal microbiota. So, we think of the U ecosystem. I can replace that with the mouse ecosystem or the rodent ecosystem, where it's not just the genetics that we're discussing in the context of variables and experiments, but we're talking about a community in the host system of interactive organisms which can play a profound effect in removing or adding key players, as I've hopefully illustrated to you today, can unbalance the system and modulate the results of your experiment. 
So what are essential criteria for successfully carrying out robust rodent experiments? We've talked about selecting the proper rodent model and controls, obviously quantifiable, meaningful readouts, sample size, and as we've illustrated today, to minimize and account for variables in the experiments and essential uh, ingredient of this is to communicate the methods completely and accurately in your publications. And lastly, to use the toolbox that the APS has developed to help you with experimental designs. Thank you very much. I think we have time for a few questions. If you can come up to the microphone. Barbara Hansen from South Florida. Um, are you familiar with the ARRIVE guidelines published yes. in 2010? For those not familiar, they're guidelines on what should be included in publications concerning your animals and how you produce them. And the goal was to reduce irreproducibility <laughs> or unreproducible problems. Your lecture just astounded me with the amount of things you included that are not in the ARRIVE guidelines. And it seems that A, they need to be updated, and B, we have to have a much better understanding of how can we really report the variables you just produced, right. which was wonderful, uh, in order to improve reproducibility. Well, it, uh, thank you. It's a learning process, and the, the, the key to me is inclusion and communication. So uh, I'm well aware of the ARRIVE guidelines. They're, they're an excellent resource for, <coughs> for investigators to go to in terms of what should be put in the method section. In and, rodents. In rodents. I would ascribe that that should be done for other species as well. And as, as we begin to appreciate the profound effect, though we've talked about experimental confounders repeatedly over decades, but I think now it really takes on focus and importance because of the whole question of irrep irreproducibility and what can we do as a scientific community to address those variables. So I, I'm sure the ARRIVE guidelines will be modified as well as other guidelines and uh, hopefully I understand that the APS journal system is going to develop their own set of criteria. So as this becomes more routine, and we teach our young scientists the importance of documentation, documentation to have that in print so that we really understand the variables that are influencing a particular study. Thank you for your Thank excellent you. lecture. Galen Edwards, University of Georgia. That was a, a great talk. Um, I was wondering about your the increase in outbreaks. How much of that do you ascribe to our better diagnostics? Uh, you know, we can certainly PCR up many more organisms yeah. now when we have, you know. Right. Now, that, that's a good point. Certainly, our diagnostic criteria are, are more robust and refined than they were 20 years ago. There's no question about that. When it was used to be an ELISA-based assay primarily for viruses, now it's, as you said, a PCR-based assay. So there is that, but there's this, this uh, nagging concern that we still have outbreaks that are unanticipated, and many times we can't trace the, uh, the origin of these different viral or bacterial agents. Or, as I pointed out, we have these uh, opportunistic pathogens like helicobacter that many academic institutions, because in a, in a wild-type immunocompetent mouse, they don't have demonstrable clinical signs. So mm -hmm. they, they have, th though the commercial vendors have uh, eliminated from their stocks and strains, the academic institutions haven't. So, and, and we're discovering all the time new organisms such as PKS positive E. coli that can cause meningitis and septicemia. So there's, it's, it's an evolving process. I agree. I had one other quick question. You, yeah. you mentioned environmental enrichment, and I, I really appreciate that. One of the things I see people wanting to do is warm their mice up to put them at a thermal neutral zone. Um, putting enrichment in the cages like hutches will do that quite effectively. As, as you probably know, if you put a hutch in a cage, yeah. the temperature in that hutch is 80 degrees right. Fahrenheit 
whereas the rest of the cage is maybe right. 70. So, but and that and that's an exact you know a, a, an example of variability. And if you're not taking that into account, and your your mouse cage has huts in it, and you're interpreting your data in a different thermal neutral zone, then it's complicated. Well, if you if all of the cages don't have hutches. If they all have hutches, I, I think you could argue that you're controlling yeah. for that. But that's, that's the importance <laughs> of dialogue and making sure, or making sure that in the middle of an the experiment, they said, oh, well, we've got oh, this yeah. new enrichment device. We're just going to change it out, and they don't tell you as the PI. Agreed. <laughs> all right, thanks, Jim. OK, thanks. Our next speaker is uh, Valerie Hamilton, and Valerie is a senior principal scientist in pathology at Merck Research Laboratories in the Department of Safety Assessment. And she ha her background is that she has a DVM degree from Texas A&M University, followed by a PhD at Washington State University, where she worked in veterinary medicine and veterinary virology and immunology. And now she's working at Merck, uh, involved in their um, preclinical drug development and safety testing. And she's going to give a presentation today on transitions from lead targets to first in human trials, how, how to do safety studies in animal models. And I'm going to try not to fly through this. Uh, I had not as much time to prepare. And I'm, I know I go over if I s talk every slide. So I'm going to skim through some of this. This is a really big topic. So basically, for a lot of you, you're doing your principal investigator work. It's research work on mechanisms. It's very. Um, targeted, you're very often using focal models. Um, what I'm trying to do is bring you from the point where you have two or three good lead op candidates that you think are going to make effective medicines and bring those into a first in human study. So um, I'm going to point out some guidances and because this is very often difficult to understand what exactly do I need to do to transition to this first in human uh, study safely and effectively. I'm going to point out a few of the uh, focal uh, things that you need to do to evaluate a candidate in order to make sure you're covering both safety, efficacy, and the potential toxicity. And then last, I'm going to at least touch on, I hope, <laughs> how you take those, those results, how you look at your, your no effect level or your no adverse effect level, and how you then translate that level in your tox species in order to go into human species or human clinical trials safely. So as you know, we take a large tier of potential targets and you're going through this process yourselves in research, narrowing those down initially with screening that you can do uh, computer models, you know, in silico assays. Once you get this down to say, you know, a few, 150, 10 targets, you're going to then start actually producing the compound. And you're going to start looking at some very specific things. Do you have structural alerts in that compound that are going to warn you away from them because of cytotoxicity, mitotoxicity? Is it going to be an effective, um, effectively absorbed compound, you know, based on what you can screen for? At this point, you're going to winnow these down even further to give yourselves maybe three or four good target candidates. And at that point, you're going to upscale that production because you want to start then taking these into these model systems. Um, very often, initially, those are targeted model systems. You may be looking at um, transgenic mice models. You may be looking at very specific in silico or in vitro assays. And so your focus there is going to be on things like your ADME, your, your absorption, your uh, metabolism and your excretion of those molecules. Is this going to be something that you can then use in a non-clinical setting effectively? Because if you can't get it into a non-clinical model, you can't test for safety. And so the focus for me very often is around this blue box. So once you've identified these few specific candidates that you seem likely to be very successful, that's when you start really determining what you want to take to a safety trial. So it's actually a pretty big leap. Um, even just getting into safety developmental type assays is a very costly endeavor and it's full of, of loss of compounds. So we typically see that from first tox to first in human, there's anywhere from about like 40 to 80% loss. 
So, and then if you look at overall drug development, there's some very good numbers out there that suggest that from those first phase one trials in drug development through a filing, so actual drug filing, you can have loss rates somewhere, you, your success rates are typically somewhere around 16%. So we're talking anywhere from 10 to 15 years. You're very often talking hundreds of millions of dollars. And so these first initial steps from taking these three or four candidates and actually getting them through successfully through safety species are pretty critical, not only from a, a cost standpoint, but more importantly, you want those compounds to be safe before you enter into a human trial. So where I want to start with this is just a very brief overview, and this is going to be covered quickly. Um, there are regulatory documents for both um, worldwide, so very often country-specific, that give us a very good sense for what are the expectations that regulatory agencies have for us to proceed into first and human. They lay out studies, they lay out the types of studies that we, they're expecting to be done. Um, each of these phases is also very well covered and we actually suffered from a lot of confusion 10, 15, 20 years ago, but we've had a lot of attempts to harmonize some of these regulatory expectations so that now we've got some, uh, I, and this was my encouragement to anybody that goes into the field, if you want to understand what they expect from you, become a wonk, read the policies, understand what their expectations are. Because very often the governments are pretty clear in what they expect to see. The regulatory agencies are very clear. They're going to give you a framework. They're not going to give you a specific set of studies they expect you to have, but they're going to give you a framework. So um, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar enough to know what a first in human study is, or in the U.S. they refer to them as an investigational new drug application. Um, these are small clinical trials. They're very often somewhere around 10 to 20 people. These are very often healthy volunteers. So again, you really want to make sure your, your molecules you're bringing into these studies are safe. As safe as you can do, as, many as, you, as much as you can do to de-risk them. They may be a single dose. They may be ascending doses. Um, if you need, because of your target, to pr proceed for a longer period of time, you may see a first in human trial go for several months just to show that you have pharmacokinetics. These studies are designed for pharmacokinetics and for tolerability. They're not pharmacodynamics. So pharmacokinetics is how you affect the drug. How is it absorbed? How is it metabolized? It's not there to show that you have an efficacious compound. It's there to show that you have a tolerated compound and that you um, are minimizing some things like the, the potential for side effects and potential for drug interactions. So it, again, it's very critical that these first in human enabling studies you do in preclinical species provide the essential safety prior to going into humans. So what's the price of getting it wrong? And anybody that wants the slide set, I can give them to you. We have a couple of examples. So overall, first in human styles, uh, trials, there's numerous ones, thousands that go on in the U.S. every year. Overall, they're typically very safe. But we've had a couple of trials that have really hit the news in the last 12, 15 years. T. Gennaro produced a uh, CD28 super antagonist. And the first time they entered into uh, six healthy s subjects, they sent all six healthy subjects into uh, multisystemic organ failure because of cytokine storm. Um, this was actually after going through a full set of cinemologous monkey trials. The target for action for that, for the CD28, is within 98% homology in cinemologous monkeys to humans. They had no effect in the cinemologous monkeys and their entry into humans was at one five hundredth of the dose that was tolerated, well tolerated in the monkey studies. The clue there came from some very early pharmacokinetic in vitro assays, and it wasn't much of one, but that was, that was one of the things in hindsight that seemed to have been missed. So they were very focused, and many of us are in our uh, small molecules, on um, what your in vivo, what your safety studies tell you, what's your NOAEL, what is your no effect level, and then you factor down from that. It's very important to look at those in vitro assays and those pharmacodynamic assays 
and bring that information into your selection for first in human doses. The second one actually occurred two years ago, and that was with a compound that was produced by Bale in uh, Portugal. And I'm drawing a blank on the type of compound, but this was actually something that had, that class of compound had been used successfully in phase one and phase two studies. They still haven't quite deciphered exactly what happened. They were successful in uh, 100 mg single dose studies, was well tolerated in humans. They uh, were successful with uh, multi-dosing at 20 mg, but when they did an advancing dose starting at 2.5 mg and up to 50, what they saw was five of their patients at 50 mg were ended up being hospitalized. One of them actually died from neurologic uh, issues. So it, again, it's, this has caused some strengthening in both the US and the EU regulations. Uh, European Medical Agency has twice now revised how they expect you to select your first and start first in human dose. They're definitely putting more and more weight on some of these in vitro assays and some of the structural analysis, not just going in and saying my safety studies, this is my NOAEL, I'm going to factor a safety factor into that, and that's my first dose. So it's actually very important, and I'm glad to see the regulations are recognizing that you're not always going to screen everything just because you're in two species of, of preclinical species. So ICH guidances, when I mentioned there are some overarching guidances that are out there now, International Com Council for Harmonization has put out multiple guidances, or excuse me, guidelines on what they expect to see from the point of what packages, what studies to, to run, what packages to submit, the quality of the packages, the quality of the and rigor of the, the studies themselves, whether they're complying with IACUC guidelines, whether they're complying with GLP standards. And uh, these are very useful, and I would say that this is probably one area, if you want to understand some of these first in human studies, the ICH M3 R2 guidance. I'm not going to tell you the name because it's like 25 words long. <laughs> But um, MCH M3R2 is a multifactorial guidance that discusses this entire process entering into first in humans. It's very useful. It's a long read, but it's very useful. Um, again, these are non-binding, but many of the worldwide agencies, especially FDA, EMA, and Japan, follow these guidelines. So what should your non-clinical safety studies be providing you? First and foremost, you need to identify a target. You need to characterize the toxicity to that target or multiple targets. You should be classifying what kind of dose response you're seeing with this. So with that toxicity, is it dose proportional toxicity? You're going to want to look at your... Um, Exposure and your concentrations as they are based typically in plasma. And um, it, additionally, and we'll talk a little bit about this, you need to know if you're generating any toxic metabolites. So a really good understanding of the target and the mechanism of your compound, not only in humans, but as it applies to some of the safety species, is very critical. These safety studies should tell you what your maximum tolerated dose is. And it should give you either a no adverse level or a no effect level in order to be able to use that to gauge what you're going to go into your first in human studies. And it's also going to hopefully start to uh, help you understand whether these are reversible toxicities or monitorable toxicities because obviously the type of toxicity makes a big difference. Uh, if you're working in a neuro compound and you see vacuolation, there's not much chance that you want to go anywhere near that dose that created that toxicity. If you're working with something and it has a secondary effect on the liver and you start to see liver toxicity in your, in your rats or your monkeys, that's something that you can start your starting dose and monitor humans very successfully for as long as it's reversible. So again, these are all designed for these studies to, to give you a safe starting dose that you can still gauge your efficacy. So it's a little bit of a breakdown. There's a very nice paper here that they discussed um, 35 different um, IND submissions 
and most of these were small molecules. Some of these were oncology compounds or biologics. The majority of studies that go into these packages are typically pharmacology studies. A lot of these are short-term studies. So in other words, we want to look at what the dose does to our major pharmacologic systems, your cardiovascular system, your CNS. And those are done at physiologic levels, not necessarily super physiologic. And you want to uh, assess what kind of impact you have as an inadvertent, rather very often it's not direct target related. So the second biggest group was ADME studies, obviously. So ADME studies also are very often shorter term studies, single dose studies to understand that absorption, to understand that excretion, make sure that the, the absorption and metabolism you're seeing in your, in your safety species is consistent with what you expect to see in your humans. And then the small green box, or the small green wedge there is actually your toxicology studies, so your safety studies. So even though people think of safety studies as being the large number of studies that are going to support these, it's not as many. Um, these are the more expensive studies. They're also the more time-consuming studies. So you're going to go into in vivo systems, uh, longer time periods, and also higher numbers of animals. So you can have a statistical read on that. So some of the things that are important to get correct. Your species selection. And everybody thinks, or at least when I went in, it was like, oh, well, you always use four species. And while it is true that we very often use rats, mice, dogs, or monkeys, um, if you can't demonstrate your target in those species, you're going to go, have to go to a different species. If you've got two species that both have your target, you're great. If you've got one, you're still appropriate. So you can look for on target in one species and off target in another. If you have no species in your standard catalog of species that you look at, that have your target, you're probably going to have a longer, more expensive road. There's another reason to look at these standard species, and that's background. So as we were discussing, genetics is a big thing. Everybody responds differently. By using similar species consistently for these safety studies, we get a really good sense for what our background lesions are. If you have only six monkeys at your high dose, and you have one that has renal disease, if you can understand that that renal disease is actually something that occurred as a biologically natural event as opposed to a result of your compound, that's critical. Um, and the reverse is true. So if you've exaggerated something that's normally a, a, a low-level incidence of background finding by applying your compound, you want to know that. So there's no required species. Very often, the regulatory agencies also are more comfortable to see the routine species used. And I'll cover a little bit about metabolites because that's kind of its own special little thing. And again, the other thing that I was confused over, I came in and I said, how the heck do you select a dose for human studies when you've never been in a human? So there's a lot of information that you can use to do this. Um, it seems like it's a, a crystal ball of gauging it. but the reality is you have literature. You may be working in an area where the class of compounds been looked at. There are in vitro assays that will help you gauge that. You can put them in uh, in vitro human cell lines. There are also transgenic models that will help you gauge where your dose should be. So. so some of the expectations for these early studies are that you dose at a limiting dose, at least initially. So a limiting dose is, is even defined in these, in these uh, regulations as being 1,000 mg per kg per day. Or you can dose at a maximum feasible dose. Maximum feasible dose may be the limit you have based on the solubility of the vehicle. It might be the limits you have based on just your dosing physical amount that you can put into that test system. So you can only dose a mouse with so much material. Their stomach's only so big. But the expectation is there that in the early studies, you want to dose maximum feasible dose, 1,000 mg per kg per day. Or once you get a good sense for where your human dose is going to be, you can cap at a 50-fold margin. So that's considered appropriate for your safety dosing, even if 50-fold margin, is it, you get that by dosing 25 mg per kg per day. That's appropriate if you've got a good sense for 
the margin is large enough over your human therapeutic dose. Uh, you can also see saturation of exposure, and that will cap your dose. So if 500 and 5,000 give you the same plasma exposure, you don't have to dose every single study at 5,000 mg per keg per day as your high dose. Um, this all varies. So if you're developing an oncology compound and it's for patients that are terminal, there may be a much higher tolerance level for something like a two-fold margin or certain side effects. If you're dosing for a pediatric compound, they may want you to not fall below that 50x margin. You may be dosing at uh, limit doses through a long series of studies because of the safety. So there's always caveats. What was it we were talking about? It depends. Um, not dosing high enough. That's a, that's a Q one. So if you didn't do maximum feasible dose, didn't do ma maximum tolerated dose, especially if you do other studies to assess other endpoints, if you're not just looking for your NOAEL, if you had gene tox associated with that first study, you were looking at the bone marrow, wanted to see the micronucleus assay, was negative. If you didn't dose at a maximum feasible dose for that study, it's likely the regulatory agencies are going to go, no, we don't agree, you've got to go back and do that. Sometimes um, dosing too high. So we have typically three doses. You have a control group, low, mid, and high. Low is designed to give you some margin, but be very close to a therapeutic exposure. High dose is designed to show toxicity. You don't have to turn toes up every single time, but you should show some form of organ toxicity so that you can watch how that progresses over longer and longer dosing periods. Mid-dose gives you some idea of dose exposure. If you dose your mid-dose and your high dose so that you have significant mortality and morbidity, and it's not appropriate to use either one of those as a start, as anywhere close to a starting dose, and it leaves you one dose, and if that one dose is at your potential human therapeutic exposure, you didn't leave yourself a lot of uh, room to wiggle there. So you may be going back and redoing that study to get yourself a better spread so you can understand dose exposure. Where does my toxicity stop? It's interestingly, I never thought of it, but oral dosing for preclinical safety studies is the only point where your vehicle is different. In every other type of study, if you're doing IV, if you're doing IM, your vehicle that you deliver the dose in should be the same as the one in your preclinical species, should be the same as the one you're delivering in humans. Obviously, we're not going to tablet our rats and our mice and even our dogs and monkeys can be difficult. So. Um, so it is important to choose to think about both your route of administration and what you're using in terms of a vehicle. One of the worst things that they can do, and the chemists love doing this to you, is they'll get into a study, you've done two weeks in a rat, two weeks in a monkey, you've got a nice exposure margin, you've got a nice spread, and they'll say, guess what, we went from amorphous form to a crystalline form. Isn't that great? And you'll say, what kind of exposure do you get with that? Oh, it increased our exposure, it increased, increased our absorption by threefold. And you go, okay, give me some more, we'll be going back and redoing those studies. So changing form midstream will cause you to have to go back and redo those studies. If your margins aren't there, your spread isn't there, so you can't make that same scientific judgment off of those studies, you'll repeat them. Um, it's rare, but sometimes they'll change the route of administration. You may do an entire safety package s s consistent with supporting an IND, and then somebody decides that they want to give this for a respiratory indication. You cannot use that oral within limits that oral dosing paradigm for your safety studies won't be able to be used. You're going to have to go back and do respiratory dosing. Now, once you establish what respiratory inhalation, absorption, and what your, your PK limits are, then you may be able to bridge back. Um, not testing different vehicles. Now, this can burn you and you don't realize until the very end. The expectation with the regulatory agencies, if you have something where you have limited margins, and the reason you said you had limited margins was, say, solubility. So you put this into a vehicle. It was a suspension. 
and you capture plateau of uh, absorption because of that, when you get to the point where you're submitting that, they may want to see what you tested. In other words, could you have shown toxicity or increased your exposure in those preclinical species if you had chosen a different or better vehicle? So it can impact your margin, and it can be something you want to consider. And rarely you will see some toxicities that are associated with the vehicle themselves. For the most part, we're aware of those, and we avoid those vehicles, but captazole in a dog, you're going to get some baculation in the kidney. If you're using that in a study where you ha are looking at a renal drug and you get some changes that indicate baculation in the kidney, is it toxicity or is it captazole? So remember this and that big blue area. So again, there's some guidances on safety pharmacology, uh, specifically S7, A, and B. And there's two tiers of safety pharmacology studies that are considered to be important. The uh, first tier is looking at your cardiovascular system, your respiratory system, and your neurologic system. Those are required before you ever enter into humans. And the reason that there's a number of these studies done is, is they'll do a layering approach. They'll do both in vitro and in vivo assays. Sometimes these are layered onto studies that you're already doing for safety. Sometimes they're independent studies. You have to do telemetrize animals. So these assessments can be very important. Um, primary PD studies that are both in vivo and in vitro so that you get a sense, uh, PD, sorry, I'm slanging, uh, pharmacodynamic studies. So you're going to look at your pharmacodynamics in some of your safety species. It's going to give you an idea what the pharmacodynamics will be in the, in the humans. And again, these are dosed at pharmacologic, not toxicologic levels. There may be some special studies that you need to do. Sometimes it's phototox. If you have a, a compound that absorbs in a particular spe light spectrum, it may indicate that you're going to get some phototoxicity. If you get um, abuse liability for compounds that, with neurologic. So there's a whole series. And then your second tier supplemental pharmacology studies that you don't necessarily have to do unless you have an indication would be stuff like renal, GI, autonomic nervous system screens. And I'll cover these pretty quickly, and then we can focus on a little bit more of things that are critical. Um, again, there's a safety guidance for genotoxicity. Your minimum testing to get you into person human requires that you look at mutagenicity, mutagenicity and that's in the AIMS assay. It's a bacterial assay. It also want, they also expect that you look at chromosomal aberration potential. And there's a, a selection of studies you can do. It sounds pretty boring, but basically you can look at a lot of different in vitro assays. You can also do in vivo assays to see if this has mutagenic potential. So you, these, are, these are tests that you want to do as a screening tool, and they're not something you're ever going to test. You're not going to look for carcinogenic potential in a human. You're not going to ever test in a clinical study for carcinogenic potential. You're not going to ever test for uh, reproductive impacts in a human study. So there's some important de-risking studies, especially as you get further and further along, that are going to be needed to be included prior to your phase two studies or during your phase two prior to your phase three. Some of the stuff I never really thought about. You've got to de develop an analytic method. So I'm preaching to you that you have to know what your NOAEL is. You have to know what your plasma exposure is. If you can't analyze that in plasma from the rats and the monkeys or the dogs and the mice, if you can't analyze it effectively in humans, if you can't do that consistently, then you don't know what your margins truly are. So there's a very detailed set of assessments where they expect you to understand how much drug is in the preparation? How much are you giving? Is it stable in that preparation? How much drug is in the plasma and the serum? Sometimes in biologics, you're going to get antibody response. And so you can actually see the amount of drug in your plasma disappear because you're binding to antibodies. You may see side effects because of that. So they're going to expect you to understand that. How stable are your preps when they walked it downstairs in the vials to analyze and it sat out on the table for three hours? Did that actually degrade your drugs so that you said you had toxicity and you, had you said you had toxicity at a certain plasma level, 
but that wasn't really the case. Or did it degrade because of light exposure? So all of these things need to be known in advance. It's nice that if you have an organization that thinks about it ahead of time, so you don't have to learn it, but if you don't, it's gonna impact your timelines. And when you're working in a smaller f company, you're sending stuff out to Contracts Lab, these are things you have to think of in order to, to make sure your studies are, are producing or giving you the results you want. So I discussed metabolites, and there's a very thorough discussion of metabolites um, currently in a lot of the ICH guidances. So if you have a metabolite and it is enough of your total drug, you need to make sure that you don't have toxicity from that metabolite. Not only that, you have to make sure initially that you have covered that metabolite in one of your safety species. So in other words, that metabolite has to be present in those species. So you have to do some work, pre-work, to look at what metabolites are most likely to occur in a human before it ever goes in, and then you have to look at those metabolite uh, factors or peaks in your safety species and make sure that you covered that. Um, they actually didn't cover it really well in the ICH guidance M3R2, and they have a Q&A section below, and that was where everybody hit them with the specific questions, so it's kind of interesting to see the evolution of that, of that uh, discussion. So, so again, non-clinical risk assessment. What are your key findings? You want to understand the pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics of your ta target mechanism, you need to understand not only how it works in humans, but at least be comfortable with how it impacts your animal species that you've chosen to, to look at. Uh, you need to make sure that those target mechanisms are there. And you need to understand if you're going to have potentially secondary findings associated with that. So did you get decreased food consumption? Decreased food consumption resulted in a decreased weight, body weight loss, changes in organs such as your reproductive organs because rats will shut down their reproductive organs when they're losing weight. You have to be able to interpret, is that a direct effect of my molecule or is that a secondary effect because I'm causing body weight loss? So you're gonna have to take these results in toto and really kind of in depth sit down with a group of people that scientifically have different areas of expertise to formulate what are the impacts? What's the dose response? What's your no adverse le level? because it's, you have to define adversity. So adverse might be body weight loss or it might not. What's your appropriate safety me metric to then decide on a human dose? And what's the onset and the duration of the, of the target toxicities that you're seeing? So most small molecules use the maximum recommended starting dose calculation, which is you take your NOAEL for all your species, then you look at the most appropriate species, and that's based on your pharmacologic target. You then can convert that exposure to a human equivalent dose, factoring in the body size. And then you take that human equivalent dose, which here we've got a, a 600 mg human equivalent dose. So the highest dose that I saw no effect in my monkeys was 300, or it was 30 mg per kg per day. I convert that, I've got a 600 mg human equivalent dose. You're gonna incorporate safety factors from there. And those factors can very much depend on what your target is, and what your toxicity is. At minimum, they expect you to down ramp that from at least tenfold, and then you can start at that dose. What we find is that occasionally does bite us because again, this is focused on NOAELs. This is focused on in vivo safety that's done in a rat and a non-rodent and a rodent species, and you're factoring equivalent body weights and then down ramping that, that amount and saying, that's what I can start with. You need to be looking at the pharmacology. You need to be looking at the in vitro assays to make sure there wasn't anything you missed. So despite the fact that many of our packages recently have gone in on, maximum, on the, uh, the maximum recommended starting dose, what we're seeing is in, the, in Europe, they're focusing more on what they call MABEL, which is a minimum, minimum active biologic effect level. So what's the minimum level in a human that I will see a biologic effect? You can start at that dose, and then you can creep up. 
So there's some safety doses, there's some, some modifications of what we choose our first in human dose at. Oh, 25, okay. So um, I'm not gonna go through the guidances. These are boring, <laughs> even for me. But I will say that if you want a list of the guidances, if you think you're going into industry, I've got a selection of guidances here for you. Tried to make it as interesting as this can be. All right, thanks Valerie. We're just a little bit behind schedule, so if you have a question for Valerie, maybe come up after the session. Sure. Our last speaker for the session is Tom Cheever, and Tom's a program director at um, the National Institute of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Disorders, and his background is he's a PhD, has a PhD in, in, from Minnesota in molecular biology and biophysics, then he did a postdoctoral fellowship at Mayo Clinic, and then he did one of the AAAS uh, public policy fellowships and then ended up at NIH. And he's gonna to talk to us today about um, rigor and consideration of biological variables and particularly how to uh, how the NIH is instructing both investigators and uh, reviewers about how uh, those variables should be covered in research applications. Thanks very much, Dan, and thanks to the organizers for allowing me the opportunity to talk with you today. And I wanted to start off real quickly with just what exactly my role is at the NIH. So. Uh, I'm a program officer. You might also hear of us called program officials or program directors, all the same thing. And one of our primary jobs is really to help applicants work through the NIH system at really kind of two points, all the way up to the peer review process and then immediately after that. And um, it, you know, it's working through all the NIH um, policies and systems and specifically helping you navigate those, which can be uh, changing and have been changing more so as of late uh, and recently. So I think the first uh, two presenters really kind of set up the landscape that we're working in quite well. Um, the, there, you know, there's a reproducibility crisis that's been quite well documented, uh, and it's drawn significant public uh, attention and concern from not only the public, but also their elected officials. And that's relevant because, uh, you know, for the federal support of the biomedical research community, we are dependent on maintaining the trust uh, of the public and being transparent in what we're doing to try to ensure that, that we're following everything we can to ensure rigor and reproducibility in the work that the you know, American taxpayers are supporting. So what is NIH doing to address this? Everything that I'm gonna be talking about today is actually already in uh, effect. And I, I do think it's important to emphasize that I think many, many people in the field were already really following these principles and have been uh, for, for long periods of time. Uh, in recent years, we've just tried to formalize this and make it more transparent, again, to do everything we can to, to demonstrate to our stakeholders that we're taking this seriously and that we take the rigor and reproducibility of what we support very, very seriously. So NIH policies, um, you know, what I've mentioned, everything is, is in effect here, but it's possible things can change. And this can be in response to congressional action, it can be in response to uh, advances in science, which seem to be happening more and more frequently, uh, and also just as needed if we find that policies aren't working for various reasons. And I actually think this is one of our biggest challenges at NIH, is communicating these policies to you in the research community in a clear and effective way. And I actually think the work that the, the APS is doing is incredibly important in that area. And I would also just encourage you to keep an eye on the NIH guide, which is where kind of all of our notices of policy, all of our funding opportunities are published. And another way to kind of get a little more context around that are to follow some kind of blogs that NIH has. And I think one of the best ones out there is this extramural nexus blog. Uh, previously, it was known as Rock Talk by the, Sally Rocky, who was the previous uh, extramural research director at NIH. Uh, now it's Open Mike is the tagline for Dr. Mike Lauer, who's the current director. And I'm gonna have links to several of these blogs as I go through the talk because I think it helps provide a little bit more um, um, kind of practical advice on how to, how to follow these policies and what you can do about it. So the kind of four main principles of rigor and reproducibility that are kind of the, the bedrock to the NIH policies are these ones right here. So it's the scientific premise, the experimental design, consideration of biological variables, and then authentication of key biological and chemical resources. 
And I'm going to go through these each sequentially. And again, try to, my goal here is to try to provide you with some kind of practical knowledge of what can I, what can I take at home from this that will help me in writing kind of future NIH applications. So we'll start with scientific premise. And I think it's important to define this because I think we're finding that this is commonly misunderstood. So NIH defines scientific premise as the quality and strength of the research used to form the basis of the proposed research question. So and this is important because it's used to evaluate the rationale for the work you propose in your grant application and help reviewers assess the foundation that it's built on. Built on. Is it strong? Is it weak? Is it shaky? And we'll go into this a little bit more. Um, and, and so I did want to also define what do we mean by kind of the work that goes into or this prior re research. So that could include things from the published literature that you cite in your grant applications. It could include your own preliminary data. It could include prior observations by yourself or others. And this all gets factored into the significance review criteria. So you, know, you get reviewed on significance, approach, environment, investigator. Um, this, is, this is kind of considered in that significance part of what, how is this going to move a field forward and why is it important. And I did want to include this last bullet that uh, scientific premise is not the same thing as perceived impact and not the same thing as the hypothesis of your study. So a scientific premise can be solid, um, it, it can be strong, but if you, uh, if you find yourself being tempted to say the premise is high, you, that's not quite what we're going for here. And I've actually heard that in uh, NIH study sections. So I just want to make, make sure that everybody's on the same page of what we mean by premise. It's really about evaluating the quality and strength of the work that's supporting what you're proposing. So how, how can you use this and apply this to your, your grant application? So, you know, we discussed it's really important that you discuss the strengths and weaknesses of the prior work, no matter where, what the source of that is. Um, and, and so, you know, a kind of a classic example that gets used a lot is therapeutic studies in ALS mouse models, for example. Let's say you're interested in kind of doing something more translational with that, and there was some previous work that was done, but uh, none of it was blinded. It had an N of three, um, and maybe it was only done in male mice. You know, it's, that's maybe an extreme example, but we would say that's not necessarily the strongest scientific premise. And so you would want to try to address what are you doing in your application to kind of fill any gaps in that, in that premise and make it stronger so that reviewers can feel that there's a strong foundation on this? And re, you know, really dig into some of the details if necessary. Did they consider the key biological variables? Was it blinded? Was it powered appropriately? Um, were they using resources that you think were appropriate and are what they thought they were? Um, so again, this is important to discuss this because this is reviewed in your, and in, in considered in your overall impact score of your application. Then the second criteria that we'll be looking at is rigor in experimental design. And again, you know, we, the goal has always been to, um, you know, apply the scientific method as strictly and robustly as we can. And, and in doing that, we, you know, we're going for robust and unbiased, um, you know, design of experiments, analysis, and reporting. And it's, you know, crucial to, to mention that this includes full transparency in reporting to allow for reproduction and the building of, of building upon those findings. And so in applications, NIH, ex, you know, expects that you will describe, you know, in your experimental design section what you're doing and, and how that will help us achieve robust and, and unbiased results. So, you know, in a more practical sense, what does that mean? We know that there are page limits. Um, so, you know, we're looking for a succinct description with the necessary important details. And I'll show, actually show you an example on the next page. But um, an important point to note here is that reviewers are asked in study section to specifically comment on how rigor uh, in experimental design will be achieved. And so my biggest message for you today is help them out. Help them out with this. Um, uh, so, you know, help them by, you know, really kind of using some of these specific principles. Describe how um, you will be doing any blinding or randomization. Describe how you did your power and sample size calculations. Use those terms so that reviewers can, can relatively easily find that, and when they're giving their summary in the, in the study section meeting, they can describe that to the rest of the review panel and really help communicate that, that you have used these principles to build a solid foundation of the work and that it will be rigorous. Um, one other point I want to mention is that some professional societies and similar groups 
are you know, starting to or already have published specific guidances for, for specific fields um, or even SOPs that I think can be very helpful references. And this is a, you know, those are great things to cite and acknowledge in your application that you will be following this um, and just kind of further bolsters your, your case in that area. So um, this is actually an example of a kind of a, a just a, a, a kind of a snapshot of a section from a research strategy plan in an, in an NIH application. And there's actually a few more examples that can be found at that uh, website on the NIH uh, reproducibility homepage. But so what I tried to do is highlight here some of the you know specific areas related to rigor and experimental design that that peer reviewers are instructed to look for and instructed to comment on. So we're looking at um, you know male and female mice for getting at biological variables, randomization. Um, group size and the power calculation that went into that. What were the statistical methods used to calculate that? Um, the you know, discussion of blinding of the uh, assessors. Those are all things that you want to make sure that you have in there and again so that the peer reviewers can easily see that and be able to, to report on that at the review meeting. And then the third uh, kind of part of this rigor and reproducibility uh, landscape is the consideration of biological variables. So uh, the NIH expects that all biological variables relevant to a research proposal will be considered. And so I think we heard a great talk uh, by Dr. Fox earlier about just how many variables there can be. And it can be daunting. So you know, I think one maybe practical advice is cons you know, consider and really focus on what might be the most relevant variables that your peers who will be reviewing your application are really going to want to focus on and try to discuss that as much as possible. And another point that I want to stress is that consideration of a relevant biologic variable does not necessarily mean that you're um, investigating that specifically. It just means that you need to consider it. And if you're not investigating it, talk about how you might control for that. Um, so, you know, I think that factors into strains of mice or age or potential underlying conditions in, in mice or other um, animal models that you're using. Those are the types of things that you want to be looking at. Um, and I'll actually get to have a couple slides on sex as a biological variable, which is one that's, you know, quite important for the NIH. Um, actually, well, we'll go to that right now. So uh, sex as a biological variable is something that we haven't always been good at considering in the past and something that NIH is really focused on. And again, in study section meetings that review grant applications, this is something reviewers are specifically asked to discuss. If they don't, the chair of the study section will ask them to, to address it. So um, the NIH expects that investigators design studies that take sex into account. So unless you have a scientifically justifiable reason, you need to study both sexes. Um, and you also need to describe a plan for how you will report data on this and disaggregated by sex, even if it's not powered to detect a sex difference. And I'll, I'll expand on this a little bit here um, in that it, so considering sex as a biological variable is not the same thing as doing sex differences research. So, um, you know, we get a lot of comments from, from applicants saying, well, if I, if I need to study both sexes, I'll need to double the amount of animals that I'm using, um, and it will cost more money, that kind of thing. And that, that may or may not be the case depending on the research that you're proposing. So um, in order to, if you're doing sex differences research, so looking specifically for differences between sexes, then yes, you need to be powered for that, and that needs to be part of your research plan. But it, not everyone is doing sex differences research. So in, in that case, you, you need to consider it. So unless you have a reason not to, you need to include both sexes, but your study doesn't necessarily need to be powered for that. So that's an important point, and I think one that's been often misunderstood in the community. Happy to elaborate on that further if there's any uh, further confusion. Um, but just to kind of get more into kind of more practical advice of how do you make sure that you're complying with this policy. Um, you know, ways to do it are in, include both sexes or provide a, a scientifically justified reason not to. Um, consider it, the influence of sex in study design. Consider uh, stratification if that would be appropriate. Consider how you'll be aggregating or reporting on uh, data as it relates to sex differences. Um, and, and, you know, this is just like a snapshot and not an exhaustive list. Um, and so, you know, if you're interested in delving more into this policy further, 
the NIH has an office for research on women's health that has a very extensive website um, and with a lot of useful tools that I think that can help you better understand what are all the different factors that you need to, to look into when considering sex as a biological variable. And one other um, slide that I hope is maybe helpful in navigating this policy is um, this is actually kind of a flowchart that reviewers have access to when they're reviewing grant applications. And you know, you can start on the left and see does the study involve vertebrate animals or humans? And if it's yes, we go to the right. And this is where it, you know, it underscores this question of is the study designed to look specifically for a sex difference? If the answer is yes, then it, it needs to be adequately powered to address that question, just as it would be for any other variable that we were considering. If the answer is no, then we will go to this next box of are both sexes included in the study? If if the answer is no, then you need to have a strong scientific justification for that. Cost is not one, but studying ovarian cancer or prostate cancer, that is an understandable and scientifically justified reason. Um, it, if both sexes are included, then reviewers are asked to look for, you know, does the proposal talk about um, plans to report data by individual sex? And you know, NIH gets a little bit of pushback on this and, and how is that if it's not powered, why are we doing that? I think the real point is that um, this could be the foundation for finding a sex difference later. So um, by reporting it disaggregated, we can start to see are there any trends that are worthy of further investigation and hopefully you know, prevent some of these cases where we've gotten into clinical trials and found that there are significant sex differences in how drugs are metabolized that have caused massive and significant problems and hopefully try to prevent that from happening in the future. Then the kind of last criterion I, I, that's part of the NIH rigor and reproducibility initiative is authentication of these key biological and chemical resources. And I think this has also been uh, challenging for the NIH to communicate what, what we mean by this and how to kind of follow this policy because, you know, key biological and chemical resources sounds a little vague. Um, so to try to help with that, I think it's important to consider that for this section, which is actually an attachment in your application, we're talking about resources that are already established. If, if, you're, if you will be generating it as part of your proposal, then include that in the research strategy because that is part of your research strategy. These are, these are resources that have already been generated. And you know, in order to try to hone in on what are the ones that we really need to address in this section, think back to what's what, you know, the rationale of why we had this policy. So we know that there are significant issues with cell line contamination. We know there are significant issues with um, antibody specificity. We know there are issues with genetic drift in animal models, for example. So the things that worry you are the things that are likely to worry your peers. That's the kind of thing that we want to see in this, uh, this section. So you can think about resources that might uh, differ from lab to lab or differ over time. You can think about resources that have qualities or aspects that could influence your research and have a significant impact on the outcome of your data. So you know, just to try to give you some examples, think cell lines, uh, think antibodies, animals, any specialty chemicals or any kind of other biologics. But what we're not really talking about here is your sodium chloride or your heat buffer solutions. Um, that's, not, that's not what we're focused on here. Think about the ones that are, that are that are likely to have some variability um, and likely to have you know, pretty significant effects on, you, on your research. So what kinds of things do you want to discuss in this, in this uh, plan, this attachment? So you want to focus on just describing how and when you know, would you authenticate a cell line um, or any other cr you know, critical chemical reagent. What kinds of things will you do to authenticate your genetically modified animals? You know, will be PCR in them or we would do some kind of southern blot or, or something like that. Um, what will you do to authenticate antibodies? Will you test them on knockout tissue or in knockdown experiments? Um, and, and just to mention again, this is also a good place to acknowledge any kind of um, SOPs or published consensus standards that professional societies or any other um, scientific groups have done that you, know, you could use as a, a template for validating reagents in your specific field. And I think part of the challenge of, of communicating what we're looking for in this section is that it really will vary by field. And so um, it's important to look at what are kind of the, the practices in those fields and use that as a guide to help you fill out this section. Um, and, and then I just want to reiterate that 
This is only a plan and it's only one page. So we're not looking for reams of data here. Um, we're not looking for prior um, kind of experiments and, and data. It's tell us what you would do to authenticate these, these resources, um, how you will do it, how often you will do it. Um, but again, it's, it's a plan. It's not necessarily a, a report. And the other kind of important aspect of this is that this section isn't factored into the overall impact score. It's evaluated after that's determined, but it is scored as acceptable or not acceptable. And if it's not acceptable, you'll hear from people like me, your, your program officer, if we're able to fund it. And we'll ask you to try to, to flesh this out so that um, we know that there's a solid plan in place. Now, uh, one other element that I wanted to talk about that's actually not directly included in this kind of four principles of rigor and reproducibility is the vertebrate animal section of application. So anyone that's proposing to do vertebrate animal research needs to include this uh, section. And I wanted to include it in this talk today because you know, I actually go and attend or listen to just about every study section that I can that I have applications that are assigned to. And I'm often uh, hearing and seeing examples of people including um, more than they need to and more that's allowed in the vertebrate animal section. So I wanted to provide this as a little bit of a reiteration of what we're looking for here. And uh, actually, this section was uh, streamlined, I think you could say, within the last few years to try to kind of you know, reduce burden on applicants, but also hone in on exactly what we're looking for. This section is used by reviewers to determine um, uh, you know, the, whether the, the animal welfare has been considered and is scientifically justified. But so, you know, we're looking for a description of procedures, you know, what are the animals you're going to use, tell us the number that you're going to be using, the source, um, the justification for why you needed to use this model, what are you going to be doing to minimize pain and distress, and um, discussion of euthanasia. But so what we're not looking for here is the inclusion of your power analysis that you use to determine the number of mice. Because remember, that's an important part of the research strategy that's evaluated as part of the experimental plan. So it's not appropriate to include that in here, and it's not appropriate to use this section as a way to get around the page limits of the research strategy, which we know is tempting. Um, so uh, again, I think I, these are all points that I uh, made initially. Um, but so again, this is considered after the impact score, so not a part of your score, um, but it is determined to be acceptable or not acceptable. And if it's not acceptable, we're not allowed to make an award until that's been uh, rectified. So it is still very important. Um, and I have here just a screenshot of an example of, of what a vertebrate animal section could look like. And this is from the NIH Office of Laboratory Animal Welfare. And they're the ones that coordinate all of the, the animal research policy at NIH. And I wanted to include it just to give you a sense that, again, we're not necessarily looking for um, an extensive section here. We're not looking for reams of data. And, and in fact, in most cases, that would be inappropriate. And I want to stress, too, that, um, again, don't even tempt yourself with trying to include data in here, because in the most serious circumstances, that can lead to your application being withdrawn. And, no one wants to see that happen. So again, focus on those criteria that are described in the application guide um, and on the OLAW site if you want to look at that for what to include in this section. And it's relatively concise, but it's, it's provide what is needed to allow your peers, your peer reviewers, to evaluate that section. So just to kind of put this all together um, and summarize, the kind of the four elements of rigor and reproducibility that are really the foundation for this kind of NIH policy push are on the left. As you'll see, premise, rigor, consideration of variables, those all fall within the research strategy section of your application. The authentication of key biological and chemical resources is a separate attachment. The same is true for the vertebrate animal section. Um, in terms of how those are scored, how they are you know, associated in your summary statement, for example, scientific premise is considered under significance. Um, consideration of rigor and, and variables are both under the approach. And again, all three of those do factor into your overall impact score. So it's critical to address that in order to get uh, the best possible score that you can. Uh, just one other kind of plug I wanted to make is, in, in wrapping this up, the NIH, we need your help in this. And it's, and we actually were talking earlier that um, it's 
the NIH solely alone cannot enhance the rigor and reproducibility of the field. We need, we need your help as investigators in the community. We need the help of industry. We need the help of journals and professional societies like APS. Um, so again, we uh, really appreciate your attention to this matter. And I know that these policies can, can seem like a lot. They can seem difficult to handle. So I also want to make a plug to um, review resources that I'll show on the next slide. And also, when in doubt, if you have questions, contact your program officer, people like me. That's one of our primary jobs is to help you navigate the relatively complex entity that is NIH. And I wanted to put a little plug for the NIH reporter, which has recently been upgraded a little to give you a tool to find your program official, which I actually think is one of the more challenging things to do. Um, if you know what institute you're going to, that can be one way. You can go to the website and try to find out. But with this matchmaker tool, you can actually enter in any kind of scientific text in this box where it says enter your text. And it's still relatively crude, far from perfect, but it will do kind of a keyword search on previously funded NIH uh, research. And if you click this similar program officials button, It'll give you a list of names of program officers who were assigned to those um, grants. And those might be some ideal first people to reach out to. One other little plug is I would encourage you to reach out to just one person first. And if they're not the right person, they'll let you know and they can help you connect to the next person. Um, you can do something similar by looking for projects if you click the similar projects button as well. And that can help you find, um, you know, potential good fits at institutes or centers, and potential good fits for study sections as well. So I think this is an underused resource. It's actually something that I use quite a bit, too, to help me focus on things. So uh, here's just some kind of helpful links and resources. So the NIH Rig and Reproducibility page, uh, links to that extramural blog that I talked about, uh, the reporter link to help find program officials. Uh, I also want to put in a little bit of plug for one of the institutes at NIH, NIAID, has what I think is a fantastic website with really practical information on how to write an NIH grant application that gives you a little bit more, um, I think, immediately useful information than the relatively giant but still important SF-424 uh, uh, application instruction. Uh, just some other fur further resources. Office of Research and Women's Health has a lot of great tools for looking at sex as a biological variable and how to address that, and it's similar with the Office of Laboratory Animal Welfare. So um, yeah, I will leave it at that, and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Tom. If there's any quick questions, we can have them. But while, if anybody's coming up, while that person's coming up, I just want to say that all of the slides um, are going to be available on the APS website. So all of these links, hopefully you weren't frantically writing them all down, because they will be available on the APS website as a resource. And there will be a recording of the talks going along with the slides that you can download and listen to. Uh, thanks. Can I ask one quick question? Uh, well, two quick questions. Um, first of all, the uh, that was great. Um, the um, how consistent are we across institutes now in study sections? Do you feel um, that's the first question? And then second question is um, these data that we get uh, that are underpowered for sex as a biological factor. Let's say, uh, what do we do with those? I mean, what's the NIH's expectation? Because I can't, I don't know if I can really publish that. Is there any opportunity for maybe a repository somewhere? Is NIH considering this possibly or? So let me, let me try to answer what I can. So let's see, the first question was consistency across institutes. And one way might, to think about that might be is that, you know, study sections aren't perfectly aligned with the institutes. Um, so, you know, I think about, the study section that I happen to work with the most is skeletal muscle and exercise physiology. And while it's mostly my institute, there's also NIA, NIDDK, um, NINDS in there as well. And so, it, you know, the, this review of rigor and reproducibility, it does really kind of happen at the peer review level and then maybe to a, a lesser extent um, after and more programmatically. Um, so it's, we're dependent on study sections, which remember, is composed of you. It's composed of peers. So we're dependent on the peers to, to apply these principles when they're reviewing their applications. And we're also dependent on the scientific review officers to remind the chairs, if it's not being discussed at an appropriate level, to bring that up. So um, you know, I think the bottom line is that this, these policies are relatively new. So there's a chance that it took everybody a little bit of time to get up to speed. But 
they're, they've been active for maybe a couple years now. So the expectation is that this is applied uniformly uh, across the institutes. So then in terms of data that might not be powered to detect sex difference, um, I think the, the end goal of the NIH policies are to try to make that available to the research community. So I think one of my hopes would be is, um, you know, if you're not able to include it in uh, a paper, maybe potentially as a supplemental uh, data table, something like that, to try to promote to get, to get that uh, data out to the community. In terms of whether NIH will do anything on that, I think uh, probably the office of uh, yeah, uh, but so you know, I think the Office of Research Women's Health would be able to speak to that more um, than I could. Just we're limited by the funding that we have available is the the, the bottom line, though. So I think we, there are so many different uh, repositories and databases that we would like to support. Um, but I think we're dependent on the research community to help us get that data out, whether it's through a publication or a preprint or on your own websites, that kind of thing too. So I think it's it's a team effort, and we'll do what we can with with the resources we have. Hope that answered your question. Hi, Laura McCabe from Michigan State. I was wondering, um, I have a question about the animal numbers. So in the past, we used to have to put that in the vertebrae section, mm -hmm. like 10 animals times three groups times two time points or something. But is, so are you saying now we don't do that for our experiments? That would be like, it looks like we're stuffing the grant. So th what's important is that you can, you can list the total number of animals because that's still part of the instruction for the uh -huh. vertebrate animals, but how you got to that number, which is a really important component of the application to determine was this appropriately powered, that should be included in the research strategy section. And I think the rationale underlying that was reviewers are busy and they might not always be able to give enough attention to the vertebrate animal section. So by putting that information in the research strategy section where the rest of the discussion of scientific rigor is, it will allow reviewers to focus on that really important element. So the, the power analysis you, you did to come up with that number should be in the research strategy section. Sure. And you can just list, we're going to be using 50 mice for AIM-3, 70 for AIM-2 in the vertebrate animal section. But it shouldn't have that discussion of how you came to that number. But so no groups, no time points or anything? So like, I or do you, you want all that? Num you know, because we used to do something like the IOCOOK, but you'd put those numbers. Of course, the power analysis would be in the main part. Hmm. But the number part, sometimes reviewers have wanted that. So I think, again, I would think about what how are reviewers instructed to kind of review the application. So for the vertebrate animal section, they're really looking at animal welfare and safety. Um, so if reporting on, you know, breaking it down by strain or arm would be important for that, then it might be relevant to have in the vertebrate animal section. But um, if it's more, much more about the, the science that's going on in the research strategy, then that's the, that's the best place to put it. And I think part of it is that, you know, as a, a scientist, I mean, you become afraid. You don't know what you want. Then we're going to put it in all, all places yep, because we don't want to get dinged on that. Yeah, I, like, that's very understandable. Um, and so I, I think it's, it's on the NIH. And again, we're asking scientific societies to help us communicate this all. Um, and I think another thing is, when in doubt, contact your program officer. Uh, your SRO might, SROs might be a useful resource, too. Um, so again, we're, we want to give people the benefit of the doubt, but we also want to be fair and consistent because if, if one person is including additional science, you know, experimental details in the vertebrate animal, animal section, that's not fair to everybody else. So we're trying to apply things consistently, but I, I definitely hear the, the point. So then one last thing, then can the SROs be told to help maintain the consistency or something? Because if in one study section somebody can do that, but you don't, you know, then you're, you're going to be in trouble. So if there's, somebody's got to help with the consistency. Yeah, and so there's actually multiple levels of review that happen when an application comes in to look for compliance with NIH policies. So again, that, but that's all scientists at NIH going through those by hand because there's not really an automated way to do it. So we're, we're doing the best we can. I understand that we might miss things sometimes too, though. So, but I appreciate right. the point. Thanks. Hi, I'm Sarah Turner from the University of Florida. 
Mm -hmm. First, Hi. thanks to all of the speakers for a great session. Um, one thing I've had trouble kind of reconciling in my head is I absolutely agree that we want our basic scientist experiments to be very tightly controlled, worrying about all the variables that we've discussed today. But then as we move towards the clinical trial, the more bedside approach, humans are vastly uncontrolled and perhaps this is why so many of our agents fail. I think Valerie pointed out we have like an 85% loss rate in clinical trials. So are there resources or recommended strategies for kind of reconciling going from this tightly controlled uh, animal model system towards testing whether this would be uh, biologically robust enough and safe enough to actually make it worth in the investment towards a clinical trial? So that's an interesting perspective because I think what I tend to hear more is that that the clinical trials with how stringent inclusion criteria can be can often can often be relatively homogenous whereas um, there's concern about we haven't been we haven't been strict enough in controlling variables in animal models so um, I, I, I see your point on that um, I just I don't know I might like see if the, my other panelists have thoughts on that as well I think one thing that you need to think of when you're doing your research is definitely translatability and making sure that you're understanding the mechanism behind what you're targeting, not just that it worked in your particular model. Um, there's The biggest loss we see is not necessarily phase one clinical trials where we're trying this in health, healthy volunteers and we're seeing if it actually gets in. It's that phase two period where you're seeing right. if the, you have a pharmacodynamic impact. So translatability between whatever your, your resources are in um, your animal models and into humans is a big hurdle. Um, I think it's less about variability of your models and more about understanding your mechanism. And effect size is maybe another point too, that just because your p-value is less than 0.05 doesn't right. mean that that would necessarily translate to a human. So mice are small, they have simpler immune systems, there's a lot of, there's a lot of gap there to control to a human. And I would, I would encourage you to look into um, other avenues to explore whether your your target is actually um, you know effective. So, is there literature? Is there screening? Can you understand the chemical impact of that particular um, compound you're looking at, or your 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 target compound? So, not just what does it do in mice. Um, it's difficult because you know you obviously have resource limitations, and you can't throw everything at it, but if you can look into very intently what other biologic systems this has been in and what potentially uh, were the differences. Don't discard it and say, oh, well, this report came out and it was in dogs and it didn't work, but, you know, it, it didn't work because uh, the small number. You may want to actually review, you know, review that and see if mechanistically it wasn't appropriately. So the more information you can gather on that pharmacodynamic mechanism, the better if you understand your target. Thank One last you. question. You have, there was a comment back. Oh. Yeah. Uh, how about changing the animal model? Would that also be, yeah. like, a, a strategic? Definitely, so definitely. A lower class of uh, vertebrate to a lower class of uh, vertebrate. Yeah. Let's say zebra fish right now is very, um, uh, it's a new animal model. Yeah. And that is a consideration. And, and again, um, for our area, for safety, they want to see some pretty routine models, but that doesn't mean they're averse to, to testing in a, an appropriate species as opposed to just the normal species. So in an academic setting, you may not have the ability to run this assay in five different kinds of animal species, but you may be able to look up that information. You may be able to understand a little bit more about the chemical structure behind your, your compound to see if there's other things that you can look at that may show you in vitro whether you have an effect that's appropriate or pharma your pharmacodynamic effect is actually appropriate. Yeah. One last question. Okay. Um, J.R. Haywood, Michigan State University. Um, thanks to all the speakers uh, sharing your insights and good information today. So we've been having this discussion about reproducibility for 
intensively for about six years now. And I think some of the first papers were published well before then. So what's the next step? You know, what, what outcomes are we actually looking for? What, what do we as a community expect of ourselves when, as we enter this next phase of this conversation? Because I, th I think we should be leaving the awareness phase pretty soon. And we should probably have some expectations as to, and, and they shouldn't, I don't think, shouldn't be coming from NIH. NIH has already said their piece and they have their criteria. So what's the community going to do next? And I think that I may be a good one to quit on, but. Yeah. <laughs> one, thing, one thing I think that's been talked about is do we need to be publishing more reproducibility results, meaning that should we, we typically publish one and done, right? Irreproducible that, results. Yeah, both irreproducible and whether the study can be reproduced independently yeah. in a different, yeah. different institution or a different country or whatever it is, right? Yeah. And I think there is some movement in that in yeah. some of the journals to publish results that aren't repeatable or results that are repeatable. And so I think yeah. maybe there'll be some movement. Well, and, and you know, I, th I think a lot of the load has been placed on the investigator, which is appropriate, but institutions have a role in this too. And th there's been very little discussion at the level of the institution and what the institution should be contributing to this. Yeah. There has to be a move publications to also publish negative results because I mean, you get one positive and ten negative, that doesn't mean that it's true. Yeah. I mean, I know our, our institution is starting to think about, you know, large data repositories where all the data gets stored at least and is yeah. accessible. At least mm -hmm. then sure. there's a place to put some of this data that maybe can't be published in a journal but could be useful for other investigators. Yeah. And, and that, that, you see that image? We're required to send in all, all of our data. You can't be selected. You yeah. can't say, I want to send in these five studies, but these didn't work, so I won't send in it. And what we see is that that alerts the regulatory agencies to potential issues. So I may have a, a submission, and they may say, well, did you investigate the potential toxicity of, of A? And the reason they're saying that is because they've seen that class of compound, and they know that there is a tendency for that class of compound yeah. It's actually very useful, like you said, to have the negative results in there as well. So, so we also need to be aligning our results here a little bit. I mean, do, does preclinical research and in institutions need to be thinking about moving towards GLP standards? Yeah. Well, I mean, that, we, we can talk forever about, about some of these things. But anyway, I, I have to make oh, one yes. other comment, and that's about the vertebrate animal section. You know, some of the confusion could disappear if, if the vertebrate animal section disappeared. If, as I look at everything on that list, it's the obligation of the local IACUC to assure that all of that has been satisfied. So, so I have grave reservations and have had for over a decade about the value of the vertebrate animal section to the National Institutes of Health. So you might carry that back. I mean, that, it's a policy issue. There's no regulation saying that that has to exist. So the, the policy folks at, at NIH may want to rethink the value of that if, in fact, they trust IACUCs. Thank you. Great session. All right, thank you all for sticking it out. And again, these resources will be available on the APS website sometime after the meeting.